Well, Jeff Baxter has eight platinum albums and two Grammys, but he likes to call himself a hippie rock guitarist with top secret clearances. <laughs> Of rock and roll's top guitarist, Jeff Baxter is best known for his years with Steely Dan and then the Doobie Brothers. He looked the part and even had a rocker nickname. Oh, some people call me Skunk. But it turns out Skunk was also interested in something other than music. If someone had told you when you were making all those hit songs, that someday you would end up a defense expert with every clearance in the world, you would have said... I would have said, you're out of your mind. It turned out the defense industry and Congress were impressed. And Baxter certainly has no credibility problem here at the Missile Defense Agency. Good morning, General. Good morning. How are you doing? Good, good, good. The boss Thanks is three-star general Henry Obering. Any tasking for me for the, for the rest of the time I'm here? Well, what does no Jeff bring to Jeff the table that other defense experts don't? In a word, out of the box thinking. Meaning that he comes at problems and he comes at challenges that we may face with a very different perspective. Is there an example you can give me that's not classified? Very few. Um, <laughs> very few. Uh, but um, uh, when, we were, when we were looking at uh, how we could build uh, some of the, the building blocks of the missile defense system, uh, he brought some very innovative ideas, I'll say it that way. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Baxter. Well, thank you. Okay, what I'd like to do is talk about problem solving and innovation because they're not only a theme of, uh, of this conference, but something that I've been involved in for, for a long time. So what I'm gonna do is, is talk a little bit about a couple of my experiences and then talk a little bit about what I learned from those experiences and how I've been able to apply that in, a, in the real world. Now this is a $13 billion program. So imagine, if you will, you're the president of Lockheed and you get a phone call from a three-star general who says, uh, this is General Lester Lyles here, I'm sending someone out to uh, look at your defense program. He's uh, got uh, all the clearances he needs, and his opinion is gonna weigh very heavily on whether or not we go with you with a $13 billion program. And by the way, he's a guitar player for the Doobie Brothers. Hangs up the phone. <laughs> so, uh, one other quick example, wargaming. And uh, uh, I do a lot of wargaming, and I also teach the business community about wargaming, which is an interesting thing. We'll get into that in a moment. How do you fight a, a superior force. Well, you look for an Achilles heel. You look for something that gives you an advantage. You study the problem and you look around. Anyway, make a long story short, uh, first thing I did is I hacked into the naval personnel files and made everybody's wife, uh, to, sent to all their wives photographs of their husbands that looked like they've been horribly disfigured with chemical and biological weapons. Well, I'm standing inside the command cell, the door bursts open, a large marine colonel kicks the door open, grabs me in a headlock, and starts beating the crap out of me. I mean, next thing we did is he said, okay, we're gonna try something really interesting. We're gonna introduce petroleum-eating bacteria into the Saudi oil supply, so by the time he gets to Japan, it's turned into chocolate pudding. See what happens then. Next thing you know, over the speaker system says, Blue Force will pull out of the Persian Gulf at 0800 tomorrow morning. Because what we did, we didn't shoot anybody, we didn't attack anybody, all we did was find the Achilles heel because the Japanese said, if you don't do that, we're gonna pull all our money out of US treasuries. So bingo, we won the game. But here, the point of this is, if you study a problem and you study it from enough different perspectives, you will find solutions and abilities and advantages that you never thought were there. Well, how do you get this kind of thinking? Uh, one of the things that, that he was talking about that I'm gonna talk about is innovation and creativity. Well, a lot of times, innovation and creativity comes from conflict. Has anyone ever heard of the OODA loop? O-O-D-A. Observe, orient, decide, and act. The idea is that there is a small, very simple, but very effective formula for problem solving. And think about, right now when you're in the audience, think about a problem. Any problem that you've had, whether it's fixing a doorstop, to getting your, 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 uh, your son to do his homework. And look, and then apply that algorithm to that problem. And you will be amazed how that works. To analyze a problem, the best way to do it, at least in the beginning, is to break it down into its smallest pieces. 
A problem usually is very difficult to solve when it's this big 800 pound gorilla, but if you can break it down into Vienna hot dog sized hors d'oeuvres, you can solve this problem or go a long way to it. But what Boyd figured out is it's not just the analysis part, because then you have to synthesize, which means you take all of those pieces that you have broken down and reorganize them in such a way that allows you to see the problem from a different perspective and may give you an answer. Well, that's what musicians do every day. Every great ballad has the exact same chords. So somebody somewhere did their homework. They analyzed Pachelbel's canon. They synthesized it into another piece of music. Uh, so now I'm reading this thing by John Boyd and I'm saying, okay, now I totally understand where this guy is coming from. He has come up with a universal understanding of problem solving, and problem solving gets you to the next portion, which is innovation. How do you innovate? Uh, now, interestingly enough, who in the symphony orchestra has the final say in the creative outlet, in the creative process? Who's the one person in the symphony orchestra that really is the person that has the final say? The conductor. It's his game. He's up there. He's reinterpreting everything. He may decide to make something a little more rubato. He may decide to mix. He changes whatever he wants to change. And whatever these folks do, they got to do what he tells them to do. Now, that doesn't mean they're not experts. But they're not improvising. They are going from a set of rules in a very linear fashion and only being uh, conducted, interpreted, directed by one person. Not a lot of innovation. Uh, now, jazz. Does everybody know how jazz works? Basically, the concept is you take a theme, and uh, we'll, I'm going to show you that in a minute with a Steely Dan song. We're going to take a theme, and then we're going to interpret it in a number of different ways. So you take a theme, and then each person in the jazz quintet analyzes that theme. It is an analytical process. Each musician in the quintet, sextet, whatever it may be, is allowed to give, not only allowed to give their interpretation, but with a mutual and tremendous respect by the other members of the band. They not only want him to improvise, they support him in it. A great song, and any, any great musician will tell you, a great song is a great song no matter how you do it. <clears throat> so, it, it seems like there's a corollary that a great idea is probably still a great idea, even though it's applied in a different way. For instance, uh, there's this tune. It's, I remember the 35 sweet goodbyes when you put me on the Wolverine of Dan and Dale. It was still September when your daddy was quite surprised to find you with the working girls in the county jail. And on and on and on. It's a rock and roll song. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so what happens now? I'm in Nashville. Nashville is the home of country music. And um, I'm with a good friend of mine named Clint Black. And Clint says, you know that song, My Old School, that you all did? And I said, yeah, Clint, I love it. He says, you ever thought about doing it like country? I said, nope. Never thought about it. So what? <laughs> let's try it. Well, I remember 35 sweet goodbyes when you put me on the Wolverine up to Annandale. It was just September when your daddy was quite surprised to find you with the working girls in the can jail. Hey, it's a country tune. Oh, no! Wait a minute. All right, so what would happen if we were at the Baked Potato, which is a little club in Los Angeles, and say, hey, you know, it's kind of a mellow night. What would, let's, let's, let's kind of lay it back, okay. It was just September when your daddy was quite surprised. When he put me on the Wolverine up to Andale.
Now, that's the same song, right? But after taking it apart, breaking it down into its, analyzing it in a sense, breaking it down into its smallest pieces, the chords, the melody, changing the tempos, the lyric, taking the things, the little pieces, and then resynthesizing them, we came up with three very distinct answers to the same problem. There is no limit to what you can do with your imagination. All it takes is no fear, the OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, and act, analysis to break the problem down into its smallest pieces, synthesis to create something different from those, prob- those, those pieces, and then you're on the road. And I'm not saying that this is the only way to do it, but it is one proven method. The old ways of doing things are not gonna help us anymore. That's not to say that expertise and intelligence and capability and the past doesn't have something to teach us. But folks, it is the day that you stop moving, as the gentleman said, you've already lost the game. Anyway, I'd like to take some questions and I'm ready to get hammered. I, and I have no fear whatsoever. If, if we can do that. Before questions, just let's thank Jeff Baxter. Really great. Thanks, buddy.